And now, ladies and gentlemen, can we give a nice drum roll <laughs> for Pastor Ricky? <laughs> Thanks, Ryan. <laughs> Yes, yes. It was a very fun week indeed with those little ones, man. Whew. Here we are. It's Sunday. It's Sunday. I stayed up all night wondering, you know, where the sun went. And then it dawned on me. There was a blue ship and a red ship, and they collided in the Caribbean Sea, and apparently the, the sailors are marooned out there. You want Alistair. <laughs> I got one more. I never trust stairs. They're always up to something, man. Okay. That's for my father-in-law, Reuben, all the bad dad jokes. He's, he's kind of the best at those. But good morning. <laughs> good morning. Happy Father's Day, Dad. Thanks for watching. Your gift will be late. <laughs> Mom's was on time, though. That's what counts. It's really what you wanted. Well, truly, happy Father's Day, all of you dads out there. Fathers play a crucial role in their families, don't they? Providing a good foundation for their families. Uh, what a difference fathers can make in the lives of their children, in the lives of their wives. Um, how they can create a place of security and safety and provide for their families and lead as their children and, and wives crave for them uh, to take a, on a leadership role and be that, that steadfast presence. And ultimately, we know that <clears throat> buildings and families and individuals are only as strong as their foundation. So this morning, we're going to be looking at foundations as Jesus continues to teach in the Sermon on the Mount. And he's going to show us that a bad foundation will leave us susceptible to deception and false religion and false faith. But a good foundation can strengthen you to face any storm, anything. And it will give you an ultimate hope that cannot be shaken and a joy and a faith in our Heavenly Father who provides that firm foundation for us to build our lives upon. So last week we ended with the teaching of Jesus that the gate is narrow and hard that leads to life and the gate is broad and easy that leads to destruction. And we talked about how the gate is narrow because there is one way. And that way is through Christ alone, who says of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. It is narrow. The other way is broad. It encompasses everything and anything and every variation of it, including false Christs. And Jesus knew this would happen. Even during his earthly ministry, he told of those who would come after him, the Antichrists or the false Christ and the false teachings that would emerge surrounding him. How did he know this? Because he knows our adversary, our ancient enemy, the devil. He knows that there are two kingdoms, a kingdom of this world, which is a kingdom of darkness, and then the kingdom of heaven, which is a kingdom of light, which he came to bring into the earth. And the darkness, the kingdom of this world, will pretend to be light to lead the unsuspecting astray, even if it's you know, only something minor. It will start there and then escalate. The deeper you go into the false teaching, it will escalate. So it begins by only being one degree off. But one degree, if you travel from L.A. to San Francisco, if you're one degree off as the crow flies, you'll end up six miles off course. You will not make it to your destination. It's, it's small at first, right? But then by the time you get there, you're nowhere near where you thought you'd be. The inverse is also true, of course, for if we correct our lives by one degree, though it's a small change at first, it will make a huge impact down the road. It adds up. So fathers are called by God to be the spiritual leaders in their household, to have their hand on the spiritual rudder, helping to guide their household in faithfulness to God. And if, if they find their family putting their faith and their hope in anything other than God, fathers are called to course correct that. It's like, no, we don't trust in those things. We trust in God alone, first and foremost. 
setting the course, setting the foundation so that when the storms do come, you remain unmoved. The boat doesn't flip over. And that's what we're talking about this morning. So let's dive in. Jesus is concluding the Sermon on the Mount. We're coming to the end of it. This is, this is the last piece of it. Um, and he's teaching, again, in this naturally formed amphitheater uh, on this mountainside. And the people are sitting down as he's sitting down and teaching. And he's, he's giving a warning to the people as he's concluding. And he's teaching them to stay on course. Stay on course. Keeping our gaze and our foundation upon him and no one and nothing else. For all else is sinking sand. And so this is the entire thrust of the sermon. This is him concluding it all, uh, bringing it all together at the end, and it's leading us to put our faith in God alone, to seek him in a relationship, to know him as Father, to know Christ as our Lord. So let's dive in, beginning in verse 15 of Matthew chapter 7. Jesus goes on. He says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, are ravenous wolves. So they are disguised. They're pretenders. They're pretending to be something they're not, pretending to be of the light, but they're actually of the dark, of their father, the devil. And how do we recognize them? Verse 16, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. They're incapable, the diseased tree, of producing that which is good. It will always be rotten to its core. Though the the apple may look shiny on the outside, you bite into it, and it is completely rotted out. It's like those bright, shining uh, holly berries, you know, that are so beautiful and shiny and bright and red, you want to eat them, but they're poisonous. You can't eat it. It's bad fruit. And if you ingest it, you're going to start vomiting a lot. They're incapable of producing bad fruit because they they don't produce good fruit. That's their nature. So Jesus here is referring uh, to the teachings, mostly, of the prophets when speaking of their fruit. Uh, Because, you know, prophets are those who are considered to be inspired teachers about God and the things of God. So false prophets come in with the guise of bringing God's teachings, but inwardly uh, they're rotten, and so their teachings are an outworking of what is within. For from the heart, the mouth speaks. So a thorn bush does not produce grapes. False prophets will try, try to display the fruits of the Spirit, and perhaps they're, they're somewhat successful for a, t- a time in, in putting on the garments of the sheep uh, as they're inwardly a wolf, uh, but it's not going to last long. They can't keep up the act for too long, and so sooner or later you're going to see the fruit of their character, the fruit of their teaching come to fruition. So we see how Jesus uses analogy and broad but specific language here uh, to talk about these false prophets because he knows there's going to be an endless supply of false prophets and teachers who teach every deviation of the truth that they can. That's what their father, the devil, does. He takes truth and twists it. So, So it almost sounds right, but there's something off about it. So perhaps it's overly sweet. And you eat too much overly sweet things, you get a stomach ache. It makes you sick. It's not good. You know, saying things like, surely you won't die if you eat of this fruit. No, you'll become like God. That's the original lie of the devil. So false teachers will use any angle they can. They'll even use the name of Jesus. They'll even claim to teach what he teaches, but there are liars and manipulators, and you will see it by their fruit, as they themselves are being manipulated by the devil to draw people away from the true gospel, to taint Christianity, to deceive unsuspecting people, and the the false prophet is likely always seeking to control, to profit off of the people that he is deceiving, to create a Ponzi scheme. So Jesus concludes this teaching by saying, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. So their destination is being cut off and being cast into the fire. They will ultimately be brought to nothing. 
So beware of their snares. Jesus says we must beware, we must have discernment by looking at their fruits. And so you can look around the world and see the fruits of false teachings. And you can see there are countries where nobody is lining up to enter into, like North Korea. And there's countries where people are lining up to get into. And you see there's the fruits of the false teachings. No one's lining up to get into Afghanistan into Iran, are they? There, there's a, the people in there are kept in bondage because of the false teachings that brings death and destruction and despair. That's the fruit of it. So this can happen on a large scale. So we're talking about countries and nations. You talk about wars. You talk about ideas like communism and the fruit of that, the death that's brought into the world. Uh, I mean, you can talk about large, large ideas, or you can talk about smaller scale things, like on an individual basis, false teachers coming through, individual churches, false teachers coming through, denominations and nations. So Jesus is like, beware. This can bring destruction into households and families. It can bring destruction into nations. 1 John 4, 1 to 6 uh, says of this, the Apostle John says, Beloved, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and now is in the world already. And then John comforts us saying, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So several things here, but notice that foremost, false teaching most often revolves around the person and the nature of Jesus. This is where the the slightest twisting and deviations take place that lead down to further paths of deviation, saying things like, well, he didn't truly come in the flesh, or saying that he's truly not the son of God, or to say that he's, he's not God, but he's like an agent of God, accomplishing good things, but not in fact the great I am, which we know from scripture, Jesus calls himself, I am. And he says of himself, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father, for I and the Father are one. This is why the understanding of the Trinity is so important. And it's, it's like, yeah, it's beyond fully comprehending the Trinity, but we understand that there, God is three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. But they're one in nature, God. And it's so crucial because if Jesus didn't come as fully human, he could not atone for the sins of humans. And if he did not come as fully God, He could not atone for the sins of all who came before him and all who came after him. For only one man could give his life for one man. But the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, could atone for the sins of all who came before him and all who came after him. And that is why false teachers will twist it. Because if they twist that, if suddenly you're not saved by faith alone and Christ alone, let me tell you how to be saved, in fact. Listen to me. I will tell you. So false teachers seek to control. They seek to get a foothold. In the early early days of the church, it used to be that people taught against the humanity of Jesus. They could not believe that God could become a human. And so they're like, nah, he he didn't really come in the flesh. That's like what the Gnostics would teach. Now people teach against his divinity, saying things like he was a great teacher, he showed us the way, but to say that he is the way, that he is divine, that's going too far. In fact, that means if he is who he says he is, we have to submit to his authority and call him Lord. So false teachers will use any angle they can. And often false prophets, as we've seen in 1 John, are deceived and taught by deceiving spirits. Spirits pretending to be angels of light, but truly they're messengers of darkness and deceit. Go to any section in a library on spirituality and 
religion, and it's going to be chocked full of, of new age, just garbage, right? It's like, and, and these, these writers are like, my spirit guide told me this, and, and they told me this, this, and this, and in fact, you know, my, my spirit guide was telling me um, as I was channeling him that, you know, the Bible's not really quite true. Let me correct some things that the Bible got wrong for you so you can know actually the truth. Everybody else is deceived, but man, you're going to know. Right? And that feels pretty good, doesn't it? They're going to seek to manipulate people. And, and, and this is it's becoming more and more rampant. And so false teaching is going to use any angle it can to manipulate us any way it can, manipulating emotions, seeking to get a foothold. And when they do, they'll get control. So just as the false prophets do, these deceiving spirits pretend to be angels of light. Like, oh, they're beautiful. But once you dig down into their fruit, there's darkness there. So people are drawn in because they know how to tickle our ears, to tell us what we want to hear. So Jesus says, beware, beware, (laughs) be on guard against this. Listen carefully. Even if what they sound, says sound eloquent and good, you gotta compare that with what God's word says. Compare it to scripture and the truth will be revealed. And furthermore, false prophets uh, might even show signs and wonders. So again, beware, Moses says in Deuteronomy 13, he says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder uh, that he tells you comes to pass, And if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So so it's interesting, isn't it? God has made himself known to us through his Hesed, that Hebrew word that means the loyal love, the steadfast love of God. And he is calling us to love him in that same manner, in that steadfast, loyal love to him alone. Not seeking any other gods or idols, but giving him the first seat in our heart as our beloved. That we love him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this is exactly what the false prophets, our adversary, is, are seeking to, to pull us away from. Our first love of God, our loyalty to God. Because our love for him is a precious thing in his sight. And it's an adulterous act to pursue other gods. To go after other things to try to get what you want. And so, fair warning here from Moses in Deuteronomy, false prophets might actually have accurate predictions. They might actually show a sign or a wonder, but if they then tell you to follow after other gods, you know that the true power behind them is satanic. And it's not of God. It's a test from God, in fact, to see if we truly love him. I'm spending a lot of time on this because of the age that we live in. An age like no time before, so where information is disseminated quicker and faster than any time before. And it could be manipulated like never before. And so it's, it's more important now than probably ever in human history that, that we have a foundation upon God's word, that we compare everything we're hearing with that. And when the false, and when the false prophets rise up, they need to be called out. We need to beware of them. We need to guard our church against them and our families. Which leads us to verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Notice he said, I never knew you. These are are people, or not people who lost their salvation. And said, they never truly had it. That's important to recognize, as it is just as important to recognize 
what true salvation is. Knowing Jesus. And when you know him, you believe him. Which leads to a trusting and an obedience to him. Seeking to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. Because we know that day is coming. So Jesus is drawing our attention to that coming day of judgment for all mankind. And we should ask ourselves, do we know Jesus? Do we know him? Does he know me? Meaning, have we invited him in? Have you asked, sought, and knocked as he opens the door for you? And you open the door for him. There's a relationship. There's a trusting that happens. There's an obedience that happens. So how do we do the will of the Father in heaven? What did the Father say on the Mount of Transfiguration? He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. <laughs> Listen to him. Listen to Jesus who gives another warning here that there are those who invoke the name of Jesus to cast out demons or to accomplish mighty things even perhaps claiming the name of Christian, but they were never truly Christians. There was never truly a transformative relationship with Jesus that happened in their lives. There's this great story in Acts chapter 19 about the seven sons of Sceva who were traveling exorcists. And they tried to cast out uh, this demon out of this person, and they invoked the name of Jesus, saying, uh, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul proclaims, be gone. And the evil spirit said, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And then this possessed man attacked the sons of Sceva, beat them to a pulp, and they went running out of the house wounded and naked. Because of this, all the residents in Ephesus where this took place, both Jews and Greeks, uh, fear fell upon them, and they extolled the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, there is power. Do not be mistaken. These seven sons of Sceva, you know, they, they invoked the name of Jesus because they knew it had power. They'd seen and heard Paul do this thing and doing miraculous things, casting out demons, healing the sick. So they viewed the name of Jesus like a talisman or an incantation they could use to gain power, prestige, and authority for themselves. They saw the recognition that the early church leaders had and were gaining, and they desired to have some of that for themselves. They wanted to use the name of Jesus too, even though they had no relationship with Jesus. They did not submit themselves to him. They were just pretenders. In the end, there's only one basis for salvation. It isn't mere verbal confession. It's not spiritual works but it's knowing Jesus and being known by him. It is our connection to, them, to him. It's the gift of faith, the free gift of faith that we believe and are saved. That secures our salvation. Connected to Jesus, we are secure. Without connection to him, all the miracles and great works, they amount to nothing. So in appearance of faith, as as Jesus has talked about throughout the Sermon on the Mount, an appearance of faith is not what Jesus is looking for. He's looking for true faith. He says, when you pray, go into your room, go into your closet, close the door and pray to me. Don't pray like the hypocrites on the street corners, you know, just doing it to look impressive, to look pious, to look religious. No, seek true relationship with me. That's the calling, true relationship that brings transformation into our lives. So are you truly repentant and transformed and being transformed by Christ? Or are, are you a whitewashed wall? The storms will reveal it. Which brings us to the last section of the last teaching in the Sermon on the Mount this morning. Jesus concludes the entire discourse, the last three chapters with this, verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat, against, uh, beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, 
and great was the fall of it. So the question we must ask is, where is our foundation? What are we building our life upon? Is it upon Christ and his teachings and his ways, seeking relationship with him? Or is it upon a a false way that shifts and changes with the winds and tides and sands of culture? A way that's unsecured, a way that's unthought out, that looks good. Its appearance is carefully curated, but its underbelly is rotten. The two houses look the same, but one was built on the rock and one was built on sand. It's like when you see a log in the forest and it looks like a perfect log, you're like, I right, get some good wood out of this, and you, you turn it over, it's completely termite eaten through it. And you step on it, it just crumbles. There's nothing there, it's, it's a facade. And chapter 7 concludes with this in verse 28. <clears throat> and when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Just listening to the last section here where Jesus says of himself, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Who in the world is this guy who can say such a thing that he can teach in such an authoritative way? Who can say unabashedly in verse 23, and then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And then again, he says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What kind of teacher can say this with such authority? Only one who speaks from his own place of authority. He's in fact God the Son, the incarnate Logos, the Word of God, God in the flesh, teaching and proclaiming the truth to his dearly beloved children so they may know him because he's making a way for us to have salvation through him. And it cannot be found anywhere else. He says, follow me. Follow me. For he came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's our Lord. A few lessons as we wrap up. Number one, give your faith proper consideration. The second builder did not deliberately seek to build with a bad foundation, but he gave no thought to his foundation. If you're buying a home, a a terrifying thing to see on the listing is foundation issues, because they can cost anywhere from a lot to a whole lot to fix. So no lender wants to see that, and no buyer would really want to deal with that. So there's no cheap fix to foundation issues. So yeah, there's a risk. There's a risk involved when we give thought to our foundation because we might have to do something about it. And it isn't easy to fix. In fact, it's hard. It's hard. And if you've built your house on the sand, it has to be torn down, completely and utterly torn down. It must die and then be reborn. That's why Jesus says the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. But it's worth it because it leads to life. It's worth the hardship of tearing down the, the sand castles that we've built to build on a firm foundation that will last on to, in, into eternity. I remember last week, Jesus promised his listeners. He promised that those who ask will receive. Those who seek will find. Those who knock, the door will be opened. Jesus is available to be found, to be known, to have a relationship with him. So if you find your foundation shaky or built on sand, go to God in humility. God, help me. And that is a wise thing to do, our Lord says. Takeaway two, if you don't consider your faith, the storms will do it for you. Unfortunately, many don't give proper consideration to their foundations to do the inspection work, the hard work, before the storm comes. And the rains come, the winds blow, the the, the floods come and beat against the house. If it's built on the sand, it crashes with a great crash. And people are are left in despair, in desperation and confusion because everything they thought they'd been working so hard to build has come crashing down and they were completely powerless to stop it. Storms will come after us all. 
And God is blameless in the storms, and yet he can bring good through them if we allow him. As James says in James 1, 2 to 4, he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. And Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 6 to 9, he says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold. It reveals your true foundation, the storms. And when you pass the test, when you found that the waves and the turmoil in your life, the storms that come crash you upon the rock of ages and you find yourself resting on a firm foundation. Though everything else seems to be falling apart around you, you're secure in him. You know your hope. You know where your joy is found. And nothing can take that away. That is a joyous thing. That's more precious than any amount of gold. For you can face anything. Peter goes on in this section in verse 8. He says, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So being built on the rock means we love Jesus. It means we love Jesus. We love him so dearly, even though we don't see him. We believe in him and rejoice in him with this inexpressible joy. Because we know the salvation that's been attained for our very souls. What an incredible thing. The perfect love casts out fear. The perfect love of Christ casts out the fear of anything else. The fear of rejection, the fear of failure, the fear of loss, the fear of death. A firm foundation is a wonderful blessing that brings the peace of God into our lives like nothing else can. For it is a true hope. It's not of this world. It's of the kingdom of heaven. And finally, the last takeaway, if you've built on the rock, teach others to do the same. Teach others to do the same. As it's Father's Day, I think it's appropriate to end with this quote that someone once said about godly fathers. And notice the the godly fruit that these godly fathers teach the next generation and teach those around them. It says, he teaches kindness by being thoughtful and gracious, even at home. He teaches patience by being gentle and understanding over and over. He teaches honesty by keeping his promises to his family, even when it costs. He teaches courage by living unafraid with faith in all circumstances. He teaches justice by being fair and dealing equally with everyone. He teaches obedience to God's word by precept and example as he reads and prays daily with his family. He teaches love for God and his church as he takes his family regularly to all the services. His steps are important because others follow. Others are watching. Let's lead like Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for showing us the way, for sending your son to be the last sacrifice, to atone once and for all. We praise you for that. And Father, in this time, I pray that each one of us can examine our foundation and find if there's any cracks, any shaky points, where perhaps we've been looking elsewhere to to fill the void, looking elsewhere to gain our peace. Because, God, we we know it's only found in you. We know that hope, ultimately, is only found in you. The hope of eternity. So, Lord, we long to be in your presence. We we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. Come quickly. Uh, We long for, 
for you to be near to us, for us to be near to, to you. And we thank you that even now we can draw near to you. And you promise that you will draw near to us. So teach us that, Lord. Help us to learn that in our daily lives, that we can be continually and ever connected to you. As our love for you grows day by day, Lord, help us to be those loyal and faithful followers. For you are the loyal and faithful God, true to all of your promises, true to all your word. So we thank you for that. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Let's stand up together and sing. from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Christ was born, then the Spirit did the 